bit of a um, outline of how we manage our halls. Uh, there's been a lot of um, conversation over the last couple of years that maybe we haven't been quite hitting the mark. Um, and so uh, this presentation has been at your request. It's a, it's, a, it's a 101, how does council manage halls? What are some of the issues that we're experiencing? And moving forward, what, um, what can you expect to see? Look, I guess uh, when we did our Gearing for Growth and Greatness rejig, Two, two odd years ago, maybe it's longer now, um, we knew that venues and events and in particular halls and cemeteries needed a little bit more work. So we set up Sam's team, venues and events team, and we set up a position being Deirdre's position, the, um, the cemeteries and halls officer position to manage those two portfolios. What we've experienced in the last two years is the more we've looked at that halls portfolio, the more work there is to actually do there, the amount of support that we need to be giving our communities and our hall committees to be successful needs to change. And operationally, the executive team have been talking about what, what should we do differently in this space? And we've pretty much concluded that for the next 12 months, we need to put some more dedicated resource into picking up this portfolio, understanding it better, um, working out what guidelines we need to develop alongside our hall committees um, and, and ultimately supporting the committees in a different way. Uh, so, so that's a given. However, moving forward long term, uh, part of this presentation is sort of acknowledging that that's not going to go away after 12 months. And so one of the questions at the end of the presentation is, is, is there a general level of support for the team to... Um, continue on developing dedicated resource in this area, potentially using thing, things like the targeted rate for our halls to try and support that position. Um, so just keep that in the back of your mind. That's something that we are wanting feedback on, um, but Sam's going to talk you through 101 halls basics, how are they managed, where have they come from, what does the future look like? Um, and so I'll hand over to Sam at this point. Right. Um, bear with me while I attempt to share my screen with you. It's um, not my forte. Um, <laughs> all right. Can everyone see what I'm yep, seeing? You're up, now? Sam. Beautiful. All right. <laughs> Try and maximize this. There we go. I can see both now as well. All yep. right, so thank you all very much for taking the time to meet with us today. Um, I am sorry that it couldn't be in person, but I hope that um, the slides are enough to sort of give you whatever pizzazz we're missing that we couldn't give you in person. So, um, so uh, for those who don't know, I'm pretty sure most of you would, but I'm Sam, so I um, am the team leader for the community venues and events team, and I work with Deidre, who's our um, cemeteries and halls officer. Um, and we're just going to take you through um, today a bit of overview, so a basic snapshot of what it is the halls do and how they run, um, the current state, um, so the issues um, that we're running into, um, all the projects that are happening at the moment, um, the proposed projects that we would like to happen in the next sort of 12 to 24 months, and then the proposed solutions. All right, so I will hand you over to Deidre to start us off and um, give you a little bit of an overview um, of the halls. Thanks, Sam. Um, hi, I'm Deidre. For those of you who don't know who I am, Deidre McDonald. I'm the um, cemetery and halls officer for Waikato District. And um, when I took on this role some years ago, um, the halls, just to give you an overview of what that role meant in my um, position is the, the halls officer was predominantly a liaison with hall committees um, regarding, you know, um, AGMs, bookings, any minor maintenance um, needs from halls and any issues basically that come came up. And I would direct them to the appropriate contact and counsel to resolve whatever issues were going on. Sometimes there were mediation issues that required, you know, help with hall committees and the like. 
Um, and as Roger's already alluded to, that position has um, evolved, especially over the last couple of years. So many of you will know that that, that hall position, hall's officer position, has been a fairly simple role in the last few years, many years. But the, the hall's being becoming, I think we've seen it becoming more of a hub of the community and community committees, whole community committees have um, showed their yeah, um, need to make that more of a, um, a community hub, if you like, yeah. And so that, that role is, is increasing and developing. So I guess that's what we're here today to, to talk about and what has it evolved into. So, um, yeah, from a very simple role into something quite um, well, reasonably elaborate. So, Sam, back to you as far as um, where we go from now. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So, um, currently at the Waikato District, we have 33 plus community halls. So, um, there's 33 that we primarily work with, um, with the committees capturing those targeted rates, um, but there are other facilities in the community that we often have involvement. So for example, the Huntley Riverside Rooms are one that we often um, will manage the same way that we would the community halls and we have input in that. And then across our districts, there's a few odd halls that show up where um, potentially it's on council land, but it's um, a community owned facility. So it's run separate, um, but it's something that we have involvement with. So it's never quite a clear cut picture sometimes about what halls we do and don't have interaction with. Um, the halls are run by um, elected hall committees. So the committees are selected through their annual AGM. Um, Tuako and Narawahia are run by um, WDC, front of office staff. Um, and the Raglan Town Hall is a bit of a hybrid where it has a committee that receives the targeted rate for maintenance, but um, we process the bookings for that. Um, I know in the past it has had some tension between staff and the committee in terms of who has say over, I guess, particular bookings or processes. Um, so that's one that we also want to add to our list to look into further when we have the, um, the space to do that. So um, a basic overview of committees, no less than five members, no more than 10, um, and then your basic chair, secretary, treasurer. Um, and then historically, their res main responsibility was submitting their financial reports from the AGM to us at the end of the financial year annually. Um, so Hall Committee membership is made up of unpaid volunteers and these people um, are often on the committees for multiple, multiple terms. Um, in Topity, we just had a member celebrate his 40th mm -hmm. year um, on the Hall Committee, which is astonishing. Um, so on the plus, we have that really good level of service from community members that are committed to being part of that, but we're not seeing the uptake from the other end. We're not having a very good, um, I guess, interest from a new committee members or younger people wanting to join and learn. And so those whole committees are um, often a, a dying service in our community. We're not seeing regrowth in that space. Um, and then we run the risk of losing that historic knowledge that those committees have. Um, so what goes into running a hall? So the committees are responsible for everything from cleaning, power and internet, other utilities. Um, they manage their own booking systems, um, their own booking rates. Um, they process all their financial management. Um, they take care of maintenance of the hall and then the surrounding like grounds um, and facilities. Um, they are responsible uh, for seeking alternative funding or fundraising if they don't have enough money and then um, advertise running their annual AGM in general meetings. Um, so across the district, um, all of our halls have a different targeted rate. And I know in the past we have discussed that option of doing the blanket targeted rate, which has often been seen as unequal or um, unfair for the different size catchments and needs of the halls. Um, so currently these are the 2021-2022 um, financial year rates that are set for our hall committees. And so you can see we've got everything from, I think, $24 is our lowest up to $125. Um, so it's quite varied across the board. Um, so current state, 
So as Deidre alluded to earlier, um, historically the management of the halls has been quite an admin ad hoc role, which has primarily um, been more heavy around AGM season, um, receiving um, those financial reports in minutes. Um, as the halls are aging, we've seen an increase in need for um, more personalised one-on-one -on -one help from us as council, um, and then also as I guess procurement and health and safety health and safety sorry legislation has changed, um, the demand for I guess what we're expecting of the hall committees has also changed. Um, but we've I think lacked the the time to really build that understanding with them and take them on that journey with us. So we're often finding um, hall committees will come to us with a request and it's having to sometimes work backwards um, to problem solve with them. Um, so hall committees, as I've said, um, they're a dying service. Um, we're not seeing a very good uptake for new committee members. Um, committee members are scared to leave the hall committees because they know that there's not a very good um, pool of people coming up behind them. Um, and I think that the requirements that we need from the hall committees have grown and evolved. And so rather than a, you know, an annual meeting um, once a year, they're requiring to meet more and more and be more and more involved and do a lot more things outside of, I guess, what they signed up to 40 years ago. Um, and then between council and the hall committees, we have a vastly different relationship with those different committees. So some um, we are on you know, regular contact with and see them and hear from them. And then some hall committees, we will phone, call, email and never get a response. Um, so it does vary quite differently across the district. Um, the hall committees run by their terms of reference, which is their guiding document. Um, which is something that we're working with our corporate planners to review. Um, so this document, I don't believe is particularly old, but it doesn't reflect sort of the more specific changes in terms of health and safety and procurement that we're requiring from our hall committee. So it does need to be updated and be a lot more clear. Um, and also, um, I guess for us, from an operational perspective, that historic data regarding those halls and the committees sits between several different teams. So between properties, facilities, open spaces, assets, um, and there's no real collective portal where all of that information sits. So sometimes when we're trying to um, help with a particular issue with a hall committee, it can be quite difficult to search through that and find the right answers for them or find the reasoning why. Um, a particular decision was made at that time. Um, so health and safety. COVID has obviously played a big impact on our halls. Um, the halls cannot open at level four or level three. Um, we have provided some documentation to our hall committees about how to manage the halls safely at level two, but um, a few committees that I've spoken to with are quite fearful to even open at level two and don't feel comfortable unless we're in a level one setting. Um, the hall committees, because they run those bookings themselves, it is something that they have control over at the moment. If they don't feel comfortable opening at level two, we've not pushed the fact. Um, and so for us, we really want to, I guess, provide an environment where we can help them be more specific with those health and safety requirements. So currently um, the restrictions are um, in the previous level two, it went up to a hundred people inside, but um, that socially, like social space, sorry socially distanced um so looking at each individual hall obviously have different capacity for that amount of people um but we have i guess currently we are not able to provide them with better advice about what that max capacity looks like for them um so that's something that has come up recently um, procurement, um, the halls historically used to be a bit of a DIY. Um, the farmer down the road would come in and replace a window or the neighbour would redo the wiring on the weekend. Um, and, and I think it sort of came from that community spirit of we'll help out, that's our community hall. Um, obviously, times have changed, legislation has changed. Um, and so we really need to work with our hall committees to tighten that up and look at actually them managing 
public money, how do we support them make good choices um, to show our communities that we're using that money wisely and it's gone through the proper process. Um, I think some of the, I guess, pushback we get from committees is that it is quite a complicated process for them, um, often filling out documents or forms that they've never had to um, deal with in their daily lives, but we're holding them to a certain standard um, and they need more support to be able to do that um, the way that we'd like them to do it in line with council policy. Um, asbestos testing. So we've had seven halls be tested for asbestos and 100% of those have shown up with asbestos present in their halls. Um, the, sorry, we have a LTP project sitting with our facilities team that is going to assess the rest of um, the halls um, across the council portfolio to um, do a complete asbestos testing. Um, so we'll have some more information on that um, when that project gets underway. Um, something really cool that I'm sure you're probably already aware of, but our assets team have been working on creating QR codes for those halls that contain asbestos as a way for people to be able to sign in, uh, sorry, scan in and see um, where that asbestos is present and it helps them um, with any maintenance. So anyone coming into the building can see where it's present, what that safety plan is for the asbestos. Um, currently, I think they only have limited access to that information, but the idea is that there will be um, uh, some kind of programming in the background done so that they can receive the full information by the new year. Because um, currently I think you have to log in um, to access the full report. So that's a really cool innovation that's happening in the background as well. Um, and seismic strengthening, um, we have seismic strengthening planned for um, Tuwako, Narawahia and Raglan to take place in this LTP. Um, so targeted rate, what is a fair targeted rate for a hall? Um, so the halls that receive targeted rates, um, we take out insurance, the rates, the maintenance, um, and then fire and building um, warrant of fitness. Um, and some halls are still not covering, uh, sorry, not receiving enough to cover that ongoing maintenance. Um, so despite the amendment to the Northern halls that um, we got through council this year, there is still historic catchment and boundary issues um, across the board within wards in our district. Um, hall committees are often requesting additional resources and help um, but this needs to be balanced out to be, um, I guess, fair to our ratepayers, especially in our more um, uh, lower socioeconomic communities. It's, um, I guess, we find it, it's a hard balance to measure out what do we need for these halls versus what is unfair to put on to our ratepayers on top of their rates as well. Um, so this is a snapshot of last financial year, so 2020-2021. Um, so all the halls highlighted in yellow received less than $10,000 um, for the maintenance, um, or I guess that from that targeted rate, sorry, for their halls. Um, so what this highlights to us is that there is a large majority of our community halls who are not receiving enough to be financially viable long-term as the halls age, they are needing more maintenance, they're needing um, upgrades, they're needing all sorts of things. Um, and so in order to prepare for that, it's really hard for a hall when they're um, receiving, for example, $1,478 a year. That's not enough to cover um, if they needed a new roof, for example. Um, and then just as a reminder, these are the, sorry, losing my voice, <coughs> the changes that we made to um, the targeted rates for our northernmost halls. Um, so financial reporting and long-term health. So our halls have, um, again, a variety of different qualities in terms of their financial reporting that they send through to us. Um, some halls are really comprehensive and on, on top of it, and then some halls really struggle to understand, I guess, what that um, what they need to present to us and how to do that in a clear way. Um, so we're having some halls currently really struggle with um, reporting their incoming and outgoing, um, which is an issue because again, they're receiving a, a targeted rate, so they need to be accountable to where that money's coming and going. Um, And so some halls um, are really, really great at managing what they get and doing additional fundraising and um, seeking out funding options, but some 
local committees just don't have the time or resources within their committee in order to do that. Um, so some individual hall projects that are happening at the moment. So Medi Medi um, has currently is going to be placed on a 12 month review, which will be starting um, from the AGM, which is planned currently for November 8th, but depending on COVID could be pushed out. So the Medi Medi Hall is one that is struggling financially. They receive a targeted rate. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, what they receive um, versus what it costs to run the hall. There's about an $8,000 deficit um, each year, which needs to be addressed. Um, currently, I believe it's been topped up from general rate money, which is just not something that we can do long term. Um, so we're working with them. Um, we've told them it'll be a 12 month review. And then if at the end of the 12 months, um, we've not managed to get a good financial system in place for them, we'll look at moving that hall back into being a council run facility. Um, we, our preference is for it to stay with the community. It's their hall, it's their asset, um, but we need to work with them to help them have those skills in order to do it effectively. Um, another big one at the moment is the Huntley Memorial Hall wants to start the process to receive a targeted rate. Um, they would like to split it from the current uh, uh, facilities targeted rate that the Huntley residents pay because they don't feel it's fair to impose an additional targeted rate on their own community. Um, but we need to look at options if, if that's viable for um, the other facilities um, in the community, what that would mean, taking some money away. Um, the Raglan Gym currently wants to build an extension to their roof um, to cover a courtyard. But for us, it sort of raises the questions of they are a long-term user, but not the committee. They want to put um, an asset on our building. Um, and so it's looking at um, what's the procurement, what's... Um, the issue around um, the asset management long term, who's financially responsible, things like that. So it's never quite a clear cut process. <laughs> um, and then some additional ones, Nike would like, uh, well, they need a new roof, sorry. Um, and the quote for that is come back at about, I think, $50,000. Um, so the community wants to have a conversation about what does that look like? Where does that money come from? What's best for our community long term? Um, Arini um, is a hall committee that none of them want to restand this year. So the entire hall committee have decided that they've done their time, they've served their community, and now they need new people to come on board. Um, but the issue is they've had absolutely no interest from anyone else to join. Um, and they fear that without a committee, they're going to have to close the doors to their community hall. Um, so they have an AGM planned for the next couple of weeks, but I think it's been postponed at the moment, again, due to COVID. And then lastly, Fada Fada is another one at the moment, um, and conversations are underway to look at how do we best set up a committee to um, set them up for success now. Um, and there's been a conversation with um, Nick Johnson from the funding team looking at whether we set up an interim um, project committee who would manage the oversight of... Um, sort of those decision makings uh, that need to happen while the building's being built and then set up an official hall committee after it's been built. Um, so these are just some examples of some, um, some projects that are happening right now, real life, um, that are, I guess, over and above the typical way that the hall portfolio was set up to manage. Um, so proposed projects, um, financial stewardship. So these projects are all set up in order to empower our whole committees to um, have the skills and knowledge to be able to work with council um, alongside us to follow those processes um, and manage their halls effectively. So financial stewardship is a big one at the moment. So um, we're proposing um, doing a review with all of our whole committees to look at how do we set up their financial systems properly um, potentially looking at a consistent template across the halls. Um, we'd really like to be able to look at a financial forecasting to see actually what are their current costs, what is their um, 10 year plan, if they need a new roof, if they need new um, furniture, if they need heating upgrades, but all of our halls are um, have a different scope of what they need. So looking at individually, what is it that 
realistically they need for the next 10 years in terms of financing that, um, addressing outstanding um, annual budget deficits, as we've mentioned before, um, and working with halls to ensure that they understand why we have to go through that proper procurement process. Um, so health and safety, um, we would ideally like to have individualized um, COVID-19 plans with each of the halls for the different levels so that they feel safe and empowered to work with their communities to provide that space um, in these uncertain times. Um, we would like to run workshops with the hall committees um, and we had some planned with Zero Harm, but again, have been postponed. Um, these are to um, upskill our committees so that they understand, again, what those processes are for health and safety, how that's changed, what's required of them. Um, and so we'd really like to get the hall committees to a point where they are empowered and um, understand what that means for their specific hall and they have a better understanding of, I guess, the scope of that health and safety requirement. Um, and then long-term management, we'd really like to um, have a conversation with our hall committees about what becoming an incorporated society looks like for them. Um, currently, it's not compulsory, but it's strongly encouraged for our hall committees to be an incorporated society. Um, and what that means is they have a lot more financial protection, um, as well as um, opportunities to apply for different funding sources. Um, so currently, like if a hall committee is not an incorporated society, there's often issues with utilities such as um, like power, um, having to put it in their own personal names. So if there is ever a default on that money, they're personally liable um, versus we would like it to be in um, an incorporated society or a trust so that um, they're a lot safer and then that money is managed in a different way. Um, and again, create a 10-year maintenance plan for each of our halls to make sure that we understand actually what is the upcoming needs of all of our spaces. Um, how can we manage that? How can we work better to ensure, like if we've got five halls who need new roofers, how can we potentially look at um, grouping that procurement or something like that within council to make that process easier, um, but also, I guess, fair and equitable across the board for all of our halls. Um, I think historically there's been, I guess, differences in um, different management at times or working from different like terms of references in terms of what halls have and haven't got access to. And so just making that more consistent. Um, and then for us as well, what we really want to be able to do is increase our level of service for those halls. Um, so currently um, the halls come in to us, but um, touch on so many different um, team members across council. Um, and so we, I guess, really want to be able to take that noise off the rest of our team and um, put it in one place. And so that's, I guess, what this hall specific officer would do is they'd be able to increase that level of service and manage all of those projects. Um, and then, yeah, so something that came up, um, the feasibility study in 2016 on halls is that hall sustainability relies on that connection. The halls that were doing well at the time of the study were the halls who had connections to their local schools, to their local sports teams, to those special interest groups. Um, and so for us, um, it's also about connection. It's not just project management. It's about connecting with our halls and then empowering our halls to connect with their wider communities as well. Um, so that's a big part of what we want to do. Um, so risks if we don't act. So we have um, financial risk in terms of our whole committees are dealing with public money. Um, and it's being managed well. In some cases, it's it's not. So we want to raise that transparency and that accountability um, within our committees. Um, health and safety, as you know, legislation, you know, has changed. Um, more is required of them. Um, we want to understand what works our whole committees are undertaking before it's being undertaken um, so that we can help them um, do a good job of that. And the same for procurement, um, looking at how do we tie that financial and that health and safety aspect into it. And then level of service. Currently, we are not performing at the level that we need to perform at for these halls. There's, um, I guess the demands on us keep growing and we want to do a better job to help our hall committees. So proposed solutions. Um, as I mentioned, 
these projects are what's needed. Um, we need to complete these in order to get our halls to where they need to be for the next 10 years plus. Um, but in our current BAU, it's an unrealistic ask at the moment. Um, so the long-term success of these spaces relies on a short-term high impact investment um, in order to work with the hall committees and bring that up to standard. Um, we have, as Roger has mentioned, a 12-month secured position um, for that hall-specific role. And so this person will um, get the portfolio that you've just seen outlined to you. So the financial stewardship, the health and safety, the procurement, that will be there. This is your 12-month project. Um, but ideally, we would like this to be a full-time fixed position. Sorry, a full-time permanent position. Um, I think that giving the 12 months in intensive work done on the halls will set us up for a really good place. Um, but if we can't secure it for longer, we run the risk of not being able to deliver on it after those 12 months. Um, currently, we're discussing internally what that looks like in terms of funding. Um, so potential would be when we do a targeted rate review for our halls, um, adding an additional one to three dollars onto those targeted rates in order to create, I guess, a self-funding portfolio um, so that the money taken for the halls is going back directly into the halls in the sense of that person. Um, Perfect. So next step. So um, the scope of work that we want to accomplish is massive, um, regardless of whether we get someone um, past that additional, sorry, that initial 12 months, um, we are committed to making this work. And so um, regardless, we will be looking at options of how we manage that um, to make sure that if that person cannot stay on past 12 months, we're set up for success as well internally within our team. Um, but also the success of these communities rely on um, connection and so we ask you as their counsellors, as their connection to the community to reach out to them, build that connection with them, um, encourage people to use them, encourage people to um, be a part of those committees um, and especially at the moment being part of a whole committee is going to be a really important thing in order to continue that management um, long term. So the more new people we can get on board and upskill and teach and empower, um, the better we're set up for success. Um, and so for us also a key part of this is we'd want more data from our walls. We want more information. We want more knowledge so that when we make decisions long-term about the future of the halls, it's backed up with that information that we've got directly from our whole committees and we know how they've been running. We've tracked it, we've seen that progress. So the better relationships, the more data, the better informed decisions we can make. Um, and so essentially, yeah, the idea of this whole specific role would be as a direct partnership with our communities. And we see it as a really key connection for our vision of livable, thriving and connected. Um, so thank you very much for listening to me ramble. Um, if you have any questions or feedback, we would um, love to hear it and um, hopefully be able to answer them for you. Can you take your screen down, Sam? Yeah. Is that gone? Yeah, that's gone. Look, uh, I'm going to go to Roger before I make any comments. You got anything you want to add to this, Roger? Oh, look, I, I guess um, I'd just like to thank Sam and the team for, for providing, in my view, quite a comprehensive overview of where we're at. Um, the executive team are, are well aware of um, the team's needs, constraints and what have you, and that's why we've definitely locked in 12-month support to get this up and running. Really, in terms of what the long-term future looks like, we're, we're just wanting a bit more guidance from councillors in terms of how can we collectively work together to make this uh, more of a success than it's been uh, looking backwards? Because there are some, some quite important problems and issues to do with funding, to do with engagement of, of community groups and giving of time to actually do these important roles. So um, this is a collective uh, sort of issue that we've got. Really keen for feedback on where the team's going on this one. Cheers. Thanks, uh, Roger. Hey, look, Sam, that was a, a very good presentation. And um, yeah, it flowed very well. You did a great job of this and it was well informative. I've just got some notes I wrote down here on the way through. And I suppose some of them came up at different times. But first thing, some of my thoughts are, 
and I totally agree. We need what I would call an asset manager for our halls um, because at the moment, uh, you know, the picture quite clearly to me is a lot of communities can't manage their own assets anymore. So we need, we need that person to do that assessment. We also need a work from that, that person to do a work program based on outstanding and what maintenance are required going forward uh, over the next 10 years, which have highlighted. So that would be part of it. We also, and I know this is one that's been around for a long time, but when I see them on the screen here and I look at the, the, um, the collective uh, earnings of these halls and those targeted rates, I think we've all known for a long time that they're far too low. And part of the problem is there is allowing people within the community to set their own rates without the understanding of what's required to fund a facility like a hall. So I would say, I, I even look at my own hall of Ruwaro here, which is a beautiful brick hall, uh, $29. To be honest, I don't think we should have any hall that's probably under $45 to $50, to be honest, to uh, to actually sustain it. So those are the sorts of things. And um, yeah, I, I just think, I think we've come to the point and, and a lot of your, uh, what your feedback was, and I know that it's the same with my local hall too, there's not the people in the community that care about halls anymore or want to be part of it. And I think a lot of our halls that are successful are the ones that are in close proximity to schools um, or clubs. They're the ones that work and work well, um, but all the isolated ones that were built over the last century with throughout our district are the ones now that are no longer loved or needed in the same way because people travel. So I think we need to assess it and I think there's probably a possibility through all these halls to look towards in some cases some communities may take the option to dispose of their halls if it's no longer sustainable going forward but you know these are the questions that need to be on the table to actually um, look towards answers from communities so anyway I've said enough first one up is uh, Councillor Smith Thank you. Um, and like you, I've got a few comments on the presentation. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sam. Good presentation. Um, I just want to, um, and for the purposes of this exercise, calling the Fora Fora a community facility hall is fine, but the community is absolutely adamant that it's a Fora Fora community facility. Okay. Um, and if just on that uh, structure of the committee. So what has actually been asked by the steering committee, and just to set the scene, the steering committee is working well with council and it is going to deliver that project to the community and to council. What the community committee, with working with EWE and other groups and commerce and whatever, has asked council to set up a committee structure which will be populated by the likes of iwi community uh, users, um, commercial people, neighbours, whatever. Um, so that on the completion of the hall at handover, there is a committee in place to take it forward and ongoing. It doesn't want to have a delivery of a project with no one there to manage it. So it's not as if they want a... Uh, I, so I, perhaps I need to talk to you directly, Sam, and, and your team as to what the community really is asking council for. Um, I'm a little concerned there were a number of generalisations because there are some exceptionally well-run halls that I've learned over the last 14 years. Um, and I look at uh, Takofi, Tamahiri, uh, Gordonton, Horsham Downs, and, and, uh, and others. Uh, so don't want to, but a lot of generalisations, and I think those are targeted at those in that lower end of the spectrum. Um, so I'm just concerned that we'd be careful about that. You referred to the 2016 Halls study. Quite frankly, that was a flawed study uh, directed and overseen by a man that we knew was corrupt. So won't go into that anymore. In the case of Tokofi, with growth, um, if the district plan allows the houses, and it appears to be, um, if I'm a, a betting man, there's potentially 2,000 more houses based on that there'd be $100,000 more in income. And the community, uh, the whole committee has talked about not reducing the targeted rate of the interim, but uh, looking at converting that to a community facilities and going beyond the hall. So um, absolutely. But I think talking about targeted rates, you're looking, at, and you probably touched on, I'm looking perhaps at an admin fee 
out of the targeted rate, rate, which I think you touched on really, but it, it shouldn't go across all halls. If you are not administering the halls and having very little to do with them, as you, I know you don't have with some, then you shouldn't be t uh, clipping the ticket uh, on all halls. You should be taking money for the ones that you are managing. And remember, most of these halls have been built and paid for by the community and some of the memorial halls, they were funded by debentures and, and other mechanisms back in the 50s after the war. And uh, some of the communities are very proud of their assets. And some of the language on, and this has come through from the Tekofai Hall Committee the last time this review was done, it, it felt like a land grab where council was just trying to force a big stick on committees, not just Tekofai, but others that were running uh, their halls really well had a good targeted rate and they were meeting the outgoings. Uh, so I, I'm just a little concerned that one sweeping um, brush is, is not what's really needed here. There are different levels, uh, like we were talking about the other day with committees, tier one, tier two, and tier three. I think we need different approach. So um, happy to be involved in any working group with staff and councillors. Thank you. Happy to answer right. any questions if you want clarity. No, not point. really. I want to move on because we've got other speakers. Okay. So, um, Councillor Eyre. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Um, firstly, well done, Sam and Deirdre, on a sizable bit of work. And you've ticked all the um, boxes and I think, identifying the issues and actually how go, to go about resolving them. But what I would say, probably add another um, item to, to your agenda is also working with those committees on succession planning so that um, you know that you have the actual relevant contact details as, as those committees um, roll over. Now, um, you're probably aware in a rural area, the, the halls are the life and soul of a community and, and really particularly important in keeping those communities together. Um, but in my experience within this ward, having some 13 odd hall committees, I see some are coping really well, others are floundering. They recognise what the issues are, but they really don't know where to start in, in getting a help or actually resolving some of their issues. So I definitely support a, um, some, a key figure within council to assist them in that way. Um, but um, I just also ask that you consider not just a one size fits all approach. And whilst I know that some halls are, are clearly running the deficit, um, I think probably that actually comes down in part to them not entirely knowing how they go about increasing their targeted rate, it is firstly, and also not understanding because they're not always given reconciliation, full reconciliations about what their expenses are. And I mean, in terms of how much they're paying with insurance, um, many hall committees don't know what the excesses are and the, the, the council um, insurance policies. So just, just basically informing them of, of those obligations as well. But, but also, I think probably in setting that targeted rate, we need to be mindful of the fact of what their catchment area size is as well. So, yeah, just lots of work to do, but um, just a few, few of them, my feed, bit of my feedback there, and well done. Also happy to be involved in any further conversations as and when needed. So, awesome, thank you. Before I go to the next speaker, Councillor Church, Councillor Smith raised something which I think is a pretty uh, prudent point. And a lot of you mightn't understand this concept, but he raised the point around, and I noticed it was in part of the presentation, is if, if we have an asset manager for the purpose of looking after halls, and that's what I'm talking about is, how do we fund that? Now, it shouldn't be funded at a general rate, but should make up part of the targeted rate for every hall throughout the district, whether it's managed or not. They are still assets of council, which need to be um, reviewed on an annual basis. Uh, now, this is not dissimilar to how the drainage schemes throughout the Waikato were run. The administrative costs of that were run by the users. And I'm one of those, Councillor Smith is, a, uh, is another one, and we pay for our own administration. So I think this is no different in, in the fact that if we're going to do something like this, it is funded by the halls in themselves. And if that is another couple of dollars on their, on their targeted rate to fund that, that's what actually needs to happen. 
So I just want to plant that seed right now in my thinking. Councillor Church. Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, um, a halls are really close to my heart, so I'm happy to provide any support or help or advice, especially going through that target rate process and governance in the north um, with those halls uh, for the future. A couple of things, page 21, which is your revenue received before tax, before expenses, um, it's not exactly right. I think you haven't highlighted a couple of halls. And just one example is that, because uh, I'm the rate payer here, is at Port Waikato, where it's got a lot of uh, income, but of course it's all debt. So then I, I would be interested to see what the debt, the net is of that debt. So um, I know the Arkaka Hall, um, and also there's a couple that are not highlighted yellow. So just I'm happy to further that um, offline that, that I know of some of those halls. This other part is, um, we're talking about target rates and halls. We're talking about, as Councillor Ears said, and I agree, these halls are hard to, hard to replace. They're hard to uh, find in the first place. And, but they also go through swings and roundabouts in terms of their committees and their vibrance. So, yes, it might be some that we look at from an asset point of view and a community point of view that they're not needed for, and that should be robust. But I'd say really what we're talking about here, and it's talked about a little bit, is that rating is there are some exceptional halls and exceptional hall committees that have gone to, through long term being exceptional hall committees and exceptionally round run. So maybe it's that rate. I think we need a maybe a five, a five comment rating over 10 and then, then come down and, and analyze, as a quick analysis first of the, all of our halls because if we don't do that then we're going to be fighting fires I think and just to get an overall what's the score of each of our halls whether it's a 32 or a 75 I think that will help us in towards we're at our best resources and also for that fairness the one question I, we haven't got on here because these halls are spread throughout our district and we haven't and I've seen an old uh, hall boundary map what I think is unfair, and coming back to what you said, which I liked, is about that $1 to $3 going into a perpetual fund or a, a self-fulfilling fund, is every rate payer, resident rate payer of Waikato District Council, in fact, others as well, across our borders, but let's say our own residents, have the opportunity to, to use the services of a hall. But they, not all of our residents and property owners actually pay anything towards them. So there's a... So and there's some of those whole boundaries from the old map that I've got, which I think don't think it's really changed except in the North Waikato. There's actually pockets of people who are not paying, who are very close to halls, but also have this availability of the service, but not paying anything. So I, I would be interested to find out how many of those people are. And maybe it's as, as easy as those people, because they are provided with a service and an opportunity to use halls, that they, they pay $5, for example. So I think that may be a funding opportunity because fair is fair. Auckland City Council has actually taken it up as a general rate, right, with their halls and actually said it, we, everybody pays for all the halls and this is how we're going to manage all of them. Now, that's another thing that I recall from previous um, consultations that we were going to look at. Now, I'm not necessarily saying I advocate for it, but it should be looked at. Um, and a couple of last things. We've had uh, workshops where the hall committees are coming to Ngarawa here, and I remember it was because Councillor Dines was there, Your Worship, and I, it was him and I there, and it was a fantastic where a lot of the hall committees came in, shared between each other and shared with the community, and I really support a couple of those workshops because they were so keen to come all the way down to Ngarawa here from wherever they were. And then also the other thing is health and safety. We've done health and safety in um, probably three, two or three safety health and safety managers ago where we went around them and had discussions. What I felt was let down is that all these enthusiastic volunteers it stopped and we were they were promised we'll come back to you we'll put some stuff we'll have a page on the website bloody bloody blah, blah, blah that's specifically hall related so that all of this intellectual property uh, frequently asked questions etc can in templates advertising templates can all be put on one place but health and safety was like promised and yet we didn't deliver so if we're going to be funding this and looking at this we really have to be really clear because these are precious uh, volunteers that we're going to follow through with what we say Thank you. Yeah, okay, some good comments there. The only thing I would say, and, and my own hall, which is a couple of k's up the road, is no different than a lot of other halls on this list here. They struggle to find people to look after it, and I understand um, that the local rural Warra hall's only got two or three people that run it now, and they would love to get off too, but there's nobody coming on. And this is a perpetual problem. We can sit here, and I've sat here for 20 years and listened to this argument, and it's the same thing every time. There's less and less and less people within our communities, 
for those precious halls and those precious assets that don't want to actually be part of it anymore and would rather just pay a dollar and let somebody else look after it on their behalf. And that's a reality check for everybody. I agree Absolutely. with you. Yeah. Okay. I just... I agree with you. Um, I was probably involved. I was involved with Councillor Henderson in the, one of the last ones to get a whole committee. The Whangaratta Hall has, uh, from memory, seventy people in its targeted rate areas. That's one of its smallest map catchment areas. Seventy residents. So we had to resurrect a new committee this last year. It's only been going a year, and they, they actually had like a dozen people in the room, which is quite a lot for a little community. And that 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 community is still going with its you know com committee. It's not. It is hard. I agree. And I guess how council knows we can do it. Tickle Hong Hall is another example, same thing. So yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, some halls won't have them, but maybe there is some people that care. So I'd be interested in what happens at O'Reilly. Don't get me wrong, there there is people that care, but I just I just refer to the O'Reilly run, and, uh, and I remember them coming in a few years, four or five years ago, looking for some money to replace some windows. And I remember Dines making it quite clear that they only had a targeted rate of about seventeen or eighteen dollars. And he wasn't keen on giving them any money because he says they wouldn't put their rate up to pay for their own stuff. But they came to us for a handout. You know, it's all this sort of behaviour that's actually, uh, as finally, I think, probably caught up with a lot of communities. And and that's and if you're sitting there as a uh, uh, committee member and you can see what needs to happen, but the other four don't want that to happen, this is what happens. You, you get, uh, you know, people just don't want to pay for things. Councillor Beck. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, it's a really useful paper and, and uh, discussion that's uh, that's overdue. So thanks for uh, for bringing uh, you know some context uh, to us about that. I think in going forward, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we need to think really carefully about the level of service, uh, but from the perspective of the of the hall committees themselves. So we need to flip this around, right? So uh, we've got a couple of hall committee chairs here today, uh, a couple of community members, but actually it's mostly councillors uh, and uh, good luck to anybody else trying to get a word in edgewise. Uh, so we actually need to, to go back and ask the hall committees, what do they want? What is it that they are looking for in that legal service? And the answer I think we already know will be quite different committee by committee uh, from you do everything through to can you stay out of our business, please, because we're just getting on with it. Um, so the, my only concern about a rate uh, for admin support, if you like, to increase the level of service is it needs to be a bit nuanced. So maybe there's, I don't know, three different levels of, of service you can pick or two different levels of service or something as a whole committee. Uh, and then that translates to a different rate. You know, one might be one dollar, one might be three dollars or something. Um, that's point number one. Point number two, we, we absolutely need to address the levels of, uh, of the target rates because some are just not sustainable. And it's not another couple of bucks to fix it. It's 10 or 15 or $20, um, you know, for, for some of these halls, particularly with the work they've got coming up. Um, we know we can do that by way of community loans. Right? A 15-year community loan can actually translate through to a, small amount of money only per annum per rate pay. Oh. But there needs to be a business plan in place to say what, what the work required is and, and therefore what's needed to fund it. So I'd, I'd really encourage us to do that and, and stay away from one size fits all as much as possible. Um, and the last thing I'd, uh, I'd come to, and maybe Graham uh, from TCC might want to comment on this, uh, another thing I didn't see here on, on your paper um, and your sort of work required or things to coming up, uh, Graham, I'm aware you went through a process of establishing what our insurance was. And I actually mentioned this in the last meeting we had, and it turns out the hall was quite significantly underinsured. And uh, you might be able to, was it about $4,000, the increase in uh, premium? Three? Yeah, so about a $3,000 increase in premium per annum uh, to have it more accurately insured. Um, you think about that when your target rate is probably 10 or 15 bucks, you know, for a small rural community. It just doesn't work. Um, so we need to have a good, honest look at what the numbers really are. That would be my, my view. And talk to all committees themselves. Thanks. All right. Look, hey, some good comment there, you know, and I, and I, and I get the thing about one, one size doesn't fit all, and I've always said that too. 
the only the only issue was with that is with 33 halls here, I, I can glance down the list here, and some are run exceptionally well and probably are just as well off left alone because they do. But I also look at the majority that are actually not run well and are not well supported by their communities as much as they're loved by the community. They're not supported how they should be and how they were in the past. And that's where the problem lies effectively here. It's not in all of them. It's just in the greater majority of them, I would suggest. And that's probably in the vicinity, at least what are on this list here, that I can see probably at least 20 to 25 of them that need that level of support. Councillor uh, Willerton. Yeah, thank you. I'll try and keep it quick. Um, it's very interesting because I have a very successful halls and I've got very poor halls, obviously, with Irene. Um, I'm remembering Irene's got a reserve down the road, which is very well supported, but the hall itself isn't. And I think a lot of it comes down to the age of the halls and the maintenance, and, and there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and then, like, I, I know Freddie Kahu, for instance, they, they wanted a new roof and they just got told, oh, it's not our cost, go and sort, of, go and sort yourself out. Um, it's a targeted rate. So there's been mixed messages coming back from the council to the halls, and I, I think that's one of the inconsistencies that we need to resolve. Um, and, and really the other thing, getting back to the original point, we, we need to say different ways. Successful halls need to be left alone and actually be given more autonomy, and then halls that are, un, uh, that are struggling they need to have a lot of support. So that's probably where I'm coming from. Thank you. Yeah, and, and that's what I'm saying to you, but they need to pay for that support. I don't see yeah. why gen general rates should be propping up uh, communities. You know, I look at this and largely halls are, are, are from a bygone era. They they were something that were um, quite prominent in the last 100 to 50 years, but since then they've, they've slowly diminished in um, popularity because... I would suggest in my lifetime where I live in our hall, knowing what it and how popular it was and what it isn't now, is it's a beautiful hall, well maintained, but it never gets any use. And and you sort of think, well, it's it's seven Ks from town, five minutes. Is it worth keeping? And I'd probably have to say, if I'm being honest, probably not. Um, because there's facilities or better facilities or closer facilities for purpose. So yeah, look, there's, there's courses for horses here, but, you know, as I said, I've been around this tree a number of times over the last 20 years, and I think probably now the fact that we're actually talking about a dedicated person to actually work with these people to identify their needs, and that might come to realisation once they look at it, and I look at some of these halls on here, and, and knowing where they are in their isolation and that, it's all good and great, but the assessment on it might have it that they need $150,000 to bring them up to spec. They're going to start thinking, Christ, what's that going to cost us each? And if you go to them and say, well, it's going to cost you $125 each for the next 20 years, they're likely to say, to hell with that, we'll pull it down. So, you know, it's a, it's a reality check here. But to do that reality check, you need to have that assessment tool and the halls need to be assessed based on going forward in the future. And I think... We've got one chance to crack this because I'm sick of having this conversation about halls. This is just about as, and you've heard me talk about do dog hearings. Halls come a pretty close second at times, I can say. So let's try and have a go because I think the team here with Deidre and Sam have done an incredible job in collating all this data and I don't want to waste it. We get a chance to tidy this up and sort it out. Let's have a good smack at it, eh? Councillor Maguire, who runs a, a good hall, I've got to admit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think any hall that's close to the city will do very well going forward because uh, a lot of the people love to come out to the country and hire your hall and they're usually very, very good uh, people and don't uh, wreck it or do anything like that. They're very responsible. Uh, but the targeted rate, um, people uh, like all of us don't want rates to go up, so they stick to their guns and won't lift it, but they... If you get it up to a different right, uh, reasonable sort of rate, you can maintain the hall well. And uh, uh, but if you, you know, you're a bit light. Uh, Telfar is always a bit light. Um, um, <clears throat> Hartangi's got a uh, eleven hundred and sixty-six houses last count. So their targeted rate is about thirty dollars or so. And you know they've always got tons of money, and uh, they and always. Um, Got a good surplus there to um, carry on to the next year and uh, do big projects. But 
but that targeted rate is something we've got to encourage people to get up if they're not, you know, got enough money flowing through their account to maintain their haul. But anyway, that's me. Oh, yep. I so I think it comes back to what I just said before about an assessment done on our hauls by what is the, what do they require to actually keep them up to spec going forward over the next decade or two. And I think that'll actually quantify what their targeted rate should be. Um, I think that's that's the measure of it. And as I said, there's a lot of hauls in here that, that lead, need little or any care, but there's a hell of a lot in here that need a lot of care. Um, so how do we actually uh, do that? And I think it is to have a dedicated person go around and, and um, work on getting that assessment done so we can measure that against what they need as a targeted rate to maintain it is probably a, a real good way forward. Councillor uh, Eyre. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Look, just going back to the point you made earlier um, about the, in particular, like rural Waro Hall and the sustainability of it, I just ask that if the communities are considering maybe disposing of it, that, that some of those um, sites around the urban fringes be considered in light of maybe future proofing as well. You know, we don't want to shoot ourselves in the foots here, even if maybe the hall is surplus to requirement. As we see development in more of those rural areas, that could be a pocket of land that becomes really valuable to council as well. So just, yeah, just something to consider long term. So there, there is a clear defined process and, and disposing of a hall, and it has to be done by the um, ratepayers that contribute to it. So it has to hold a, an extraordinary general meeting with just the, um, I call them shareholders, uh, the ratepayers who pay into it, and then they, then they make the decision to dispose of it. In actual fact, the funds, because I went through this with Rural Roar a few years ago, because the committee actually seriously considered it, and I gave them the information, so I know what's in it. But one of the things is then what happens if they were to sell the asset, which does cover a, 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 an acre or two around the hall there. So um, where does those funds go? And they aren't the council's funds, they're the community's funds. So they would need to be invested back into the community somewhere. But it is actually a community decision. It's not a council decision to, to sell, I would suggest, most of our halls anyway. There's probably some that are, um, council owned outright in one way or another or sit in another format but most of the rural halls sit, sit in that aspect like that. Councillor Smith. Yeah, thank you. Two questions. <clears throat> um, can we be supplied the current valuations under the council insurance policy please of all the halls um, particularly for our areas that we represent? Uh, I'm just mindful of what Tamahiri has uh, Axel spoken about for Tamahiri and it may be that some of the committees uh, think it worthwhile getting an independent up-to-date valuation. Uh, and it may be that council needs to look at that schedule because um, these policies were so done some time ago. Uh, there may be inflation adjusted, but maybe the, in the communities who pay for it want to have a look at it. So could we do that, please? Secondly, can I ask the um, Sam and your team one of the things that uh, Takofi learned when it had the gas bottle stolen for the kitchen, um, that was in, out, in, an, in an outside cage, was that they uh, had to fund the replacement because the value was under $10,000. So I've talked to other um, committees uh, and they weren't aware of the $10,000 excess on every hall. So I think you need to build into the um, policy going forward that every hall is required to keep a minimum of $10,000 for the ability to meet an insurance claim. Uh, and that's something that I'm encouraging uh, to Kaifi and they are doing and, and Fodder Fodder is aware of it. But I think all committees have, should be working towards that. And so that actually then gives one hell of a fright to the current um, targeted rate for a lot of these halls. So there's a lot to do and a lot to think about um, because council is not in the business of funding that, um, that excess. Thank you. All right. Hey, look, um, I'm going to, uh, there's two people on here. There's, uh, where is he? Dorothy Lovell. Where have you gone, Dorothy? You're here somewhere. Uh, I'm going to ask if you and Graham uh, want to say anything. Graham, do you want to say anything? Well, can you hear me? 
Yeah, can you grant yeah. that? Yeah, uh, just first of all to uh, the council that was talking about uh, the insurance policies being um, kept up to date. Um, I understand the council is actually uh, doing that on the 1st of November. Um, but as a prime example, I, I actually think you've missed the boat a bit on the problems of the halls. Um, I can understand why people don't want to sit on committees because, to be quite frank, dealing with the council is soul-destroying. It, it got so bad with the uh, work we've just spent 250000 with just about everything's new on our hall now. Um, the first approach to the council, from the first approach to when we actually moved the first paintbrush, and admittedly COVID was in the middle of it, uh, and there was a period where I told council to get stuff, I just couldn't deal with you. Um, 12 months, 12 months from the first approach to the council to the first movement of the paintbrush. Um, now, the insurance is a really good one because I requested one proof that there was an insurance policy, something that had the insurance company's name and our name on it. Six months later, still no information. I had to change people and Jeff Ping, thanks very much. He's exceptional. Um, and I've stolen off the Tamahiri Community Committee a bit to help me. He's just exceptional. If every one of your staff was like him, but to be honest, we volunteers, and I haven't got time to go and ask and ask, and I don't want to get anyone in trouble. But you get to the point and say, look, if you don't get the information, I'm going to go to the top. But who wants to do that? It's just horrible. Um, and you've got all these new things that you're going to do and all that enforce on us and all that. But in our case, where was council when for 15 years there was no major maintenance done? Who was council when actually they didn't receive our accounts? This is pre my administration, didn't receive our accounts, and we lost our incorporated society, we lost our charitable trust designation. Who was the council then? Um, and they didn't get any accounts because none were done. Um, so just that's just a quick summary, but it's soul destroying working with dealing with a lot of members of the council. Um, I don't think they're up to their jobs. And if you get someone who's going to come and look at all the halls and need to know what he's doing, or one of us will be going out pretty quick out the door. Fair enough. Dorothy? C can I just ask what the hall he was from, please? Emma Thank Emma you. Thank you. Dorothy? Thank you, Ellen. Um, first off, congratulations to Deidre and Sam. Um, as you know, I've been working with you over the last few months and years. Um, secondly, I have a question. Um, in your insurance that you're talking about, is there a liability in that, like a public liability in that insurance policy? Like I'm not on the Hall Committee, but I've never actually asked that question before. Are you asking me? Well, no. anybody, anybody. That, like, I, I don't, I don't know. Them. Um, I don't know anybody that knows um, to do with the Halls. Um, Sam, can you answer that? Or oh, no? Alison, do you got an answer? So all of the halls are council assets, and yes, they are covered under our public liability cover. So any damage, not to the halls, but to public surrounding the hall, if there's, you know, like, I don't know, if there's, a, if there's shops or houses beside a hall and there's a party in that hall and then there's damages done to private property, is that covered under that liability? Uh, I don't believe so. It's got to be council business, but we'd need to have a look at the specific example, um, Dorothy, and understand a bit more about that. Oh, that'd be really good. Yeah. Um, um, but again, our public liability um, also has excess applied. So just for information purposes, our insurance policies are procured by way of the Waikato Local Authority Shared Services, which is a group of 12 councils um, to keep premiums down. Uh, affordable. Yep. The excess is yep. uh, set at a level that means that you know um, you're not having to pay too much in your premiums overall. Okay. Thanks, Elsa. Awesome. Just just to comment uh, before I go to Roger uh, for Graham. I think part of the problem, Graham, around working with staff is this has never been a full time job for anybody. It's been very part time by a number of people. Consequently, it's probably sits pretty low on the level of. Um, uh, having to do too much about it. And then I think probably what we're looking at here in light of uh, the Sam's paper and Debbie's paper here is, is to actually look at actually getting a dedicated person. So it is a go-to person specifically around halls. And that's why I referred to it, an asset manager for halls. 
come out of it. And I think this, that's where a lot of our problems in council have happened in the past. And I can think of other things off the top of my head where it is a part-time role for somebody. It is not their full-time job. And when I mean part-time, it might acquire a couple of hours a week at best. So that's the unfortunate should, thing about should, it. Shouldn't take six weeks to tell me I need extra quotes. No, no, no. Even if it is part-time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the people... The worst people I'm talking about are actually have gone now, um, yeah. so that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, but it, it, you know, it's not quite as simple as the presentation suggests. Yeah. All right. Back to you now, Gavin. Uh, Roger, sorry. Oh, Roger. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that, um, Mary Ellen. Um, look, I guess. Um, hey, thank you, Graham, for just letting us know um, how you see it. That's really important for us to get that feedback, and and I know it hasn't always gone well, and. Um, Look, I'm the first to acknowledge, looking backwards, council hasn't done as much as it could do to help the success of halls, hall committees um, and support our community. So that's that's not under question at all. And, and I, know, I know, Graham, just from our recent um, uh, issues around some of the works you guys want to do, uh, the landscape's changed quite a bit in terms of requirements on council, in terms of committees, et cetera, and we need to find a way collectively to make it go smoother, easier, better, because uh, some of the uh, issues you've raised, um, I acknowledge them, and um, yeah, we got to get better in these spaces. Um, I'm happy. I'm happy to be part of the solution as well. I mean, I'm a pretty direct speaker, so you know that. And there's probably people that wouldn't say what I've said, and nothing changes. But I'm happy to be part of the solution, which is great to hear, and that's how we're going to move forward. So, and no, I do appreciate that feedback. Um, look. Without going on for this this uh, workshop too long, I'm hearing general support for um, a dedicated resource, uh, not just the 12 months that we've um, locked in at an executive level, but looking forward beyond that as well. I'm hearing quite clearly that one size does not fit all and that ultimately we need to talk to the hall committees to understand what levels of service or what support they would uh, value from us. And then we need to have a bit of a look at... Um, you know, what does that mean for a fee structure? What does that mean for the range of services we can offer? Um, and so that would be part of the work of this person in the first 12 months to establish what the following time would, would or the following years would look like. Um, I guess just in terms of the reason I'm interested in the overall level of support is if we go to market for a position, putting a 12 month um, short-term position out there isn't as attractive as a full-time position. So I think I've got a pretty clear stare from, from councillors and all members of this call that um, we're on the right track and that we should really be trying to invest in this area moving forward. So thank you I for your um, support. I don't think I'd say to that, Roger. Yeah, look, and, and I support that approach. I think you just need to realise you run down the list of um, halls we're talking about and some are worth a hell of a lot more than other, but there's tens of millions of dollars worth of assets here that are that are basically not being managed very well. So in any other business, you would make sure there was a dedicated person to manage assets to that value. And I and I look at my own hall up here, you wouldn't build that hall because of how it's been built and what it's been built of, probably under four or five million dollars these days. So you start to quantify that around the district. Some are tin sheds like the one at O'Reilly and others but others are very, very valuable assets these days, sitting on uh, valuable ground. So they do require a, a, a person to actually manage the value asset. All right, I, I, can, I, can I just say, I, I did some ringing around before up in the insurance on our hall, and I don't know what other halls look like, but $3,500 a square metre, it's the top of the range, but bear in mind that if you have a complete burn down, you've got to remove all the debris and all that sort of thing, and we've got a bit of a top upstairs, which I didn't include in the square footage, but three and a half thousand square foot, not out of the way. Iron for steel structures and things going up 20% in the next few weeks and has already gone up 7%. So that gives a, a, a basic of what people could work on. It's probably a little bit over the top, but I, I don't want to be the chairman that tells my community we under you and they now haven't got a hall. <laughs> Your problem now, Graf. Right, <laughs> I'm only here. acting. <laughs> Just here. a quick queer... Just a quick query going back to the insurance. Um, I just wonder how competitive that Waikato local shared authority um, package actually is. I know the Nike Hall actually got their own independent quotation from another insurer and found it to be considerably cheaper. And there's no obligation 
for halls to actually be with the council um, shared services, isn't there? If they have their own comprehensive package through somewhere else. And that's probably something they need to know too. The only, the only thing is, and I've heard that those comments in the past too, you've got to compare apples with apples and not apples with oranges. Yeah. Some people will give you a quote, but are you competing? I'm dealing with an insurance company in a private capacity at the moment. There's a big difference between apples and oranges, I can tell you that. And you've got and to do valuations as well. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's not you guys do all the work, whereas we'd have to get valuations and yeah, yeah. Alison, so I was just going to say that uh, the contents of the halls should be covered by the individual hall committees, so that is something that is actually not competitive by us rolling it into our policies. So, our cover is really about the asset itself. So, if something happened to the asset, we could fit and it was of major expense, we could fix that under those policies. So that's what that's about. Um, and Graham's right in terms of the valuation data and understanding what it would cost to then replace it. So it's not just the value of the assets, it's what's the demolition cost, what's the reinstatement cost, all of that is something that we work through when we do our insurance schedules. Um, so if you've got a valuation of, you know, 350,000, say, very cheap one. Um, that actually it might end up costing you double that to actually put a new hall in place. So that's the amount that's been insured for. So that is sometimes where the hidden costs and the premium come from is that people are looking at the value of the hall. Okay, back to you, Deidre. Uh, Dorothy, sorry. Oh, thanks, Alan. Um, I have another question. The targeted rates you're talking about, the halls are, um, that are done, and you're talking about ORENI, is there any way that ORENI or any of these small halls could be combined with other committees but still retain their own targeted rate? Can anyone answer that or they've never been suggested before? Um, I guess it's something we could, yeah, look into in terms of structure. But so you mean, so like ORENI would um, join with like Fidikahu, for example, to make a committee but manage the halls separately yes or Tautri or Gordonton or yeah you know just combine it so that instead of trying to find people like locally they mm. could actually send it to come together but they still um, retain their own targeted rate so the um obviously the asset manager would have to obviously keep an eye on that so that money is not being spent where it shouldn't be spent I think um, I know in the past um, this has come up when a community, oh, sorry, a committee member moved away and was attending the meetings via Zoom. Um, I guess the preference is that the people managing the halls are within that catchment, so it's it's their community hall, so the ownership is should be within that community. Um, but I see what you're saying, Dorothy, and I guess it's it's not something that we've ever um, that I know of looked at. So it could be a potential for those smaller rural halls that are connected in some way for us to have a conversation around that long term. Yeah, just, yeah, long term. I just thought it might be a, you know, coming together situation. Cool, thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, Councillor Church. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, having been um, a treasurer on a, quite a, uh, a number of... Um, uh, council buildings yeah I mean I think there's a lot of work to do and, and I guess it it's made me think I was excited about the fact that we're focusing on some halls I think it's um really due and, and overdue but um what's really looking at the complexities of it and understanding how committees work and saying there's like 33 or 34 halls and all those committees and all of those people to navigate as well as the you know the, as you say the worship the, the assets and infrastructure let alone how to go forward I actually think that one person is not going to even um, is not enough of re-resourcing at all, um, and that's what I'm saying. Like, we actually have to have a bit of a understanding from a committee's point of view, from a growth to where the halls are point of view, from a structure of the halls point of view, from a governance and improving that governance. Bloody bloody blah. There's a whole raft of areas by hall, and some will be easier, and then others won't be. Or well, some will be stronger in some areas, but weaker in others is what my my perception will be of them. They might be great with one thing, or but difficult harder with some. Um, their fundraising or whatever. So I really think that actually having one person is going to be very quickly overwhelmed just with the three or four projects that you put on um, that we, you've shared with us because they're quite complex. Just starting a new hall and fodder fodder. So it's, it's complex and takes time. 
So um, I think he, I'd be interested as to how you think that's going to work across what we've discussed today with one person and be able to deliver, as I said, um, you know, in a reasonable amount of time and deliver what you're saying. Or how else can we resource um, some uh, another person, at least until we've done an analysis and understanding stage, because unless we actually understand these assets, and I include the, I say this with love to all the volunteers, is the assets of the communities as well as their physical assets, until we actually have an understanding of that first and then a plan forward and have a proper, I guess, a strategy, action plan, I think that that works in quite a big, big, bigger piece of work than one person. So I'll be interested if you think otherwise as to what that plan, <laughs> that plan is to, that, that's going to work with one person. Yes, so at the moment, we're just grateful we've got that one person um, on board for 12 yeah. months. So we'll, we'll work with what we've got, we'll do the best that we can, and we'll make a plan moving forward of how that looks. Probably what I would do is going through this um, list of halls here for me, I'd take the top off. And when I say the top, there's a number in here that are well managed and don't actually currently need that level of support. I would say that there's, there's probably, if you take that top off and see what's left, and I haven't counted how many are on this. What'd you say, 33, Sam? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So I've took 33. I could probably look at this and, and see that there's probably seven or eight that probably um, can just be put over there um, because they are uh, operating well and managing well, don't necessarily need that support. But it's that other probably 25 that, that we do need to focus on, get right. And, and as I said, uh, one I know one's probably going to struggle to get around this in 12 months, but in saying that, if um, one can coordinate what's required around assessments, and I think what could happen here is um, when you've got the assessments, you understand the quantum of the cost to require to bring the hall up to a standard, a usable standard, and specs. And, and the, the one that's going to, it's not on the table here. Well, it is on the table, but nobody's talked about is the drinking water issue is going to become a huge issue for all of our halls. And I mean, a colossal issue um, because a lot of the halls who don't have access to potable water are really going to struggle with this one. So that's going to be a real major issue for most of our halls. Never mind the leaky roof. I think the, the water coming through the tap is going to be their single biggest issue. So um, I just think once that assessment's done, I think there probably will be a situation when we're looking at what it's going to cost that we actually have to go into these communities and hold these, which I hate doing hall meetings, but with the community or the ratepayer base that does it and say, this is reality and these are your options. And their options may be, and that's why I said some of these halls will probably fold their tent and say, well, do we really need this? We've got another one just down the road. And, and I keep harping back to the O-Renny run, but there's, there's others out there too like that that probably are no longer needed or justified anymore. And the love in the community is not there anymore. So you have to look at it and, and see whether there's value in it. And it's their decision, as I said. So they'll have a choice as to whether they pay the, the increased targeted rate or they opt out to sell the damn thing. I guess I for us, um, we hope that this yeah provides those facts. So I think currently we're working on assumptions and I think we all have a pretty good idea about um, halls that are working well and that aren't working well. But in reality, like we can't make those targeted rate choices or decisions moving forward without having that backing. And I think yeah. for us, it's about having a realistic view about actually here's the 10 year maintenance plan. This is the deficit that you're in. This is the income that you're getting. What's what's the realistic picture? And that's what we yeah. hope to do with this. And that's that realistic picture that probably needs to not only told to the whole committee or that they may only, that may only equate to two or three people in some cases, but it needs to be told to that community. So it needs to go out to that targeted rate base so they understand the quantum of the problem. And that's why I say this may require some hall meetings with, with the community, wider community to explain, you know, this is your hall. I know you love your hall, but in reality, this is what's going to cost actually maintain it or bring it up to spec at least. Um, and they may balk at that and say, well, no, we're, we're not up to that. And you say, well, what's your alternative? And your alternative is, well, do you need it anymore? And I think we do have far too many halls. Um, and I look at my own one up here, I hate to see it go, but in reality, we don't need it anymore. So what do you do with it? But I think that's a conversation that's probably at least 12 or 18 months out yet. Okay, Councillor Eyre, and then we'll close it out. 
Thanks, Mary Ellen. Just before that piece of work is undertaken, though, we probably need to figure out where is the hall catchment review piece of work progressing. We undertook the, Geordie started that work, and largely we resolved the issue between Te Aka and Nike, but that was going to be a district-wide catchment review. So where is that piece of work sitting? No. Oh, I'm going to say, this is um, something we want this designated person to, to do. It's a huge piece of work, right. and currently it's it's outside what we can give it the appropriate time needed to do. So um, we hope we can capture it with this 12-month role. I think the important thing is, has the assessment of the hall, not the boundaries. The boundaries are not currently the problem. It's the targeted rate within the boundary that's, that's part of the problem. But I think we need to understand the building, the asset, and what it's, what's required to maintain it or, or, or dispose of it. But I do look at the case in point of Glen Murray, who had actually asked for their boundary to be pushed east because there's a number of users that aren't in the targeted catchment that wanted to be bought in. So that was going to influence the revenue. So I think probably that needs to be, um, that piece of work needs to be considered when we start looking at how much I, the rates I, are going to Look, I, I disagree with you. The first thing is assessment of the assets before anybody starts looking at boundaries. Um, you know, I'm not going to support doing that work uh, until such time as we understand the quantum of the problem we've got around these halls. You know, we had that um, work started. We started no, it didn't, that. Didn't, didn't start. The only work that started was the work that we actually signed off as part and concluded was the boundary shifts around the Tiakio complex, Nike, and then around those areas. But the rest of the work wasn't. So that there, was the only there work. There was a that was document. Um, to my understanding, there was a document that went out from Geordie at the end of two years ago asking hall committees on feedback for their catchment. Yeah. So we've already asked them that. Yeah. But doesn't mean to say it keeps going. That's what I'm saying to you. Okay. So, okay, so I think you've got a clear steer, Roger, where you need to go with your team. We need, and, and look, and I could, I could suggest it probably might take you the next five months just to find somebody to do this role. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I think the first thing to do is find that person. Um, look at, at um, where, I don't know where you start on this list. I have no idea. Uh, you probably know yourself as some that are poor performing um, and, and then just start those assessments on uh, what's required to bring the halls up to spec. Yep, yep, absolutely. The team will, will uh, number one, try and locate the right person and number two, we'll prioritise how we um, how we uh, eat this elephant because it does feel like a big beast. I appreciate Councillor Church's comments about the potential size of this portfolio. I will assess that, as um, Sam said, over the next um, 12 months and give you regular updates on, on how it's all shaping up and um, what the way forward is. All right, thank you, everybody. That concludes today. Uh, Noel, are you still there? Mm. But I, one thing I'd like to see happen just before you go is um, these three quotes that drive all committees up the wall. I think... Um, uh, you've got to be a bit uh, flexible on that. It's a big job to get three quotes for individuals giving their time for maintaining the hall, and um, you can't always get uh, what you want. And that's what's held up Tamahiri to a large extent, what Graham was saying. The quotes, and, and also, like, we've got our hall's 1,262 square metres, and we've got a limited of $5,000 that we can spend without asking council. Well, to be quite frank, you can't do anything with $5,000 in our hall. Um, <laughs> um, but I also recognise that everything depends a wee bit on the quality of the, of the committee at any one time. Like two years ago, you would have said our committee wasn't capable of doing the work that we've done now. However, now I was being dictated by council staff who, to be quite frank, wouldn't know half as much as I know about building in a county. Um, and so there needs to be a bit of flexibility, not we're, we're, the, we're the ones and you guys will just do as you're told because you lose, you lose your committee. So uh, you but, can't, an example, of, I'll just give you, um, Martangi spent um, 35000 on the kitchen, so the limit was 5000 so they did it in 5000 lots. I would so they, never do that. So they didn't have to interact <laughs> with it. 
<laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 sort of, that sort of behaviour council had created an inquiry, a fraud inquiry <laughs> within council. So let's not do that sort of stuff again. I know it's frustrating. No, Fine. no, uh, that was my thingy, not the... Uh, yeah, and sure it wasn't Pukki Taha. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, everybody, look, we need to wrap up. Uh, some of us got up the meeting. So thank you very much. I think Roger and team have got a pretty good steer. So thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate the uh, the effort.